Hello. Welcome to Heavy Hands. I'm Connor. That's Phil. Phil, enough prevaricating. We've been trying to figure out what we're going to do on this week's episode. Um, We know what we're going to do for the first segment. We know what we're going to do for the last segment, or possibly the second. Um, You know, Mackenzie Dern versus Jan Shaunan. That's our upcoming Fight Night main event. Phil, stop complaining. It's what we have, okay? Sorry. That's all right. I forgive you. And then we're going to do a Jose Aldo retrospective because the greatest fighter of all time is just retired, possibly for the last time. Um, and then we're going to do some undercard stuff in between or after somewhere. We haven't fully decided which of these undercard fights. There's a lot of half interesting fights on this card, as you said, Phil. There's there's ones where you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> you perk up for a second, though, so they can't be that bad. Yeah, but uh, we are but gonna. You... Mm-hmm. Yeah, they'll they'll have some intrigue involved, but they're also not ones where you're going to be uh, sitting up to wait for them. Yeah, uh, but we are certainly, without a doubt, going to start with this main event and its uh, various perplexing qualities. Uh, Mackenzie Dern, Jan Shaunan. I think the most perplexing question about this fight, and one that is not altogether easy to answer, is, uh, well, Phil, you phrased it perfectly. I'll just let you say it. Is Mackenzie Dunn going to try and win? Yeah, <laughs> that's that's basically it. <laughs> it is a question of major importance, and the answer is not entirely clear. Because she has been... She has been an interesting like case study in MMA. Like there's a there's a lot of I think Henry Cejudo in Mackenzie Dunn's uh, UFC career. Uh, the at the beginning the sort of dogged um, belief that she could just win however that you know they whichever one of them could just win however they wanted because mm-hmm. they were just that much of a competitor. The sort of general layer of unprofessionalism over the early UFC career, like mm-hmm. both of them really struggling to make weight a whole bunch of times. Yep. Uh, like, Mc- Dern blew weight in some absolutely catastrophic fashion at some point, right? Yeah, but she looked good. What's Henry's excuse? Saying that he's not a <laughs> handsome, giant, headed, uh, troll-looking dude. He's a fairly Henry Cejudo is actually a fairly handsome guy, but um, he is yeah. It's just like the the proportions are slightly odd, but yeah, he's a yeah, a good looking man. He's fine. Um, All I'm yeah, saying is, so, what, what's he cut well, weight? I, I have got the impression, like since then, that Dunn has gotten her her shit together a bit. Perhaps not to the extent that Henry Cejudo did, but I just don't think she's suited for MMA in the same way. No, she's not capable um, of making the kind of changes. I mean, Henry Cejudo is a once-in-a-generation athlete. Mm-hmm. Kenzie Dern is a good athlete and has an incredibly high-level skill set in one phase, but she's not Henry Cejudo. Also, wrestling is a better base than jiu-jitsu for MMA. That's just how it is. Yes. Um, so... You know, I think since when was it? I, I reckon. Uh, I mean, basically since she came back from from uh, having a baby, she's actually looked a lot more professional, mm-hmm. and her wins and losses have been more uh, like explicable. She hasn't had quite the same, and you know, she's even tried to take people down and wrestle a bit. Mm-hmm. Tisha Torres, and and therein kind of lies the question. Because Yan Jonan was not difficult to take down by Carl Rasparza, who is, as we've mentioned many times, much better technical wrestler than um, Kenzie Dern is. Yeah. She's also much smaller and much less potent from top position. It's true. And again, these were. It wasn't hard at all. You just. Uh, as far as it didn't need drive, she just picked up single legs and dumped uh, Jeanan on the floor, and then he KO'd her from top position. Mm-hmm. Um, don't think they spent more than a few minutes on the feet. But then, on the other hand, we have the fact that Jeanan did to McKen- did to Marina Rodriguez 
pretty sort of what Marina Rodriguez did to Mackenzie Dern. Yeah. That she just drew her around the cage and countered her as she blindly rushed in. Yeah, I'm not I'm not gonna like dig in or uh or uh or, or you know, bear my chest on a hillside here and, and prepare to die on this point. But um, on my most recent rewatch of that fight, um, as I sort of did feel watching it live, <coughs> I did think that uh, Jan Chanon actually beat Marina Rodriguez. Um, even if she didn't, whether or not you give her two rounds, she absolutely spent significant portions, like minutes at a time, making Rodriguez look clumsy and just outmaneuvering her and running her into counters and yeah, made it look very stylish. And, um, what is Mackenzie Dern? If not a much, 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 much worse version of Marina Rodriguez on the feet, (laughs) by which I mean aggressive. She swings sometimes with both hands. Uh, she can be outmaneuvered and also she doesn't really have any of the skills, but, uh, in the wild aggression that Rodriguez had exposed and countered, by Jan Shannon, there is a bit of a parallel. So it really comes down to, A, is she going to try to grapple? It would be insanely stupid if she doesn't, but it also wouldn't be the first time. And B, if so, is she even 50% as good at wrestling as Carla Esparza? What's the threshold? How much of a Carla Esparza wrestling ability do you need, do you think, to get Jan Shannon down? Given, as I said, that Esparza took her down on, I think, every committed shot. Yeah, but Mackenzie uh, is as a, a, a pretty bad wrestler. Huh? Um, yeah, but I don't think you need to be many. You don't need to be that much better than Carla Esparza. Yeah. But also, it's just the fact that Dunn is, you know... Uh, the, the other question would be, like, how much more potent do you need to be compared to Carla Esparza yeah. from top position? Yeah, because Carla Esparza looked like Khabib Nurmagomedov against Jan Janan. Yeah, and, and and there's the fact that you know Mackenzie has a huge advantage over someone like Marina Rodriguez in that her insane aggression it it really just needs to create chaos for that yeah. she doesn't need takedowns per se is what I'm trying to say that. Uh, you know, obviously not everybody can be like Tisha Torres and like get like flying arm barred and just respond by doing like the the predator handshake, you know, yeah. and just like flex, just busting out of it by flexing. <laughs> I don't expect most fighters can do that. Um, certainly no reason to think Yan Chan An's going to be that comfortable in that sequence. And that wasn't a takedown. She didn't out wrestle Tisha Torres at all. She still got her into an extremely dangerous, protracted sequence on the ground. And Tisha Torres is undeniably a better defensive wrestler than Jan Shannon. So. Yeah, I mean, that's my my thing. I think um, there are bad elements. uh, There are sort of distorted elements of Charles Oliveira in Mackenzie Dern at the moment. Mm-hmm. I think she hasn't so much learned to be a effective wrestler as she has just learned how to punch into clinches. Yeah. Uh, like that Torres fight, she was just constantly was just punch and grab and punch and grab until she had a clinch exchange. And then she did her best to make something insane happen. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I'm not entirely sure that Mackenzie Dern won that fight either. Right. But um, but she did make some ground exchanges happen, and Tisha Torres is like traditionally like extraordinarily difficult to out wrestle and mm-hmm. out grapple. I mean, who has really done it? Yeah, absolutely, nobody. Not even uh, not even I Mackenzie mean, Dern, <laughs> really. Uh, did she fight? Did she fight, um, what's her face? Or am I, am I misremembering? Uh, the, uh, huge wrestler who then disappeared off the face of the planet. Tatiana Suarez? Yeah. Yeah. Um, did Tisha uh, no, fight her? Didn't. No, she did not. Uh, but other than that, just tremendously hard to out-wrestle, but still ended up in an incredibly perilous grappling situation. Exactly. Yeah. Yan Janan isn't hard to out-wrestle, uh, 
and more than that has looked looked incredibly vulnerable against this Barza. So yeah. it's one of those ones where, uh, and also I, I remember you know I fairly confidently picked uh, Nina Nunez to beat. Um, then was it then Ansaroff? I can't remember to beat uh, Mackenzie mm-hmm. Dern because I just expected her to again be able to draw her around the cage and pull her onto shots in a way that uh, Nunes has done many times in in the past. Yep. Again, she doesn't have the she's not the the world's greatest. Uh, she's not the great world's greatest takedown defender, but. But she's um, solid and she, she uses her distance. She shouldn't have needed to be. Yeah. But as it as it happened, Mackenzie Dern simply charged her, and and yeah. submitted her almost instantly. Also, I mean, she looked like shit, but was coming off a, a long layoff. But then again, we also did have that Mackenzie Dern fight where, like, sometimes that just doesn't work. Like creating a crazy mm-hmm. scramble now and then, like the fight with Amanda Hebush, still looms yeah. large in the memory. Like Hebush just kind of similar to Jan in a lot of ways. Like, mm. reasonably athletic, very mobile. Um, they both had this kind of, um, like, predictable timing in their striking. Everything is like, yeah, 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 you know, everything falls on the same rhythm. But if they're the one leading you around by the nose, they're going to pick the right time to let those combinations fly. Um, and they're solid enough that if they don't have to take the lead, that they will win a lot of exchanges as long as they can keep leading you into their shots. Um, I will say one thing about Hebash is that she does hit a lot harder than Jan Yes, and, is and I like I think was visibly hurting. Uh, yeah, um, I think she is also a better wrestler. Yeah, it is. It is the Charles Oliveira factor. I think the sort of it doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm going to get a crazy fight. Less less Charles Oliveira fill, more Charles all over the place. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think you got to you got to pick Dan. There's yeah. just too much. Um, yeah, there's there's just too much. I think she just gets too much chances for something insane to happen. Um, yeah, she loses. It's going to look, it's going to look utterly damning. Yeah, it literally will just be another, it's like, will be another fight of her simply trailing someone around the yeah. cage for five rounds, just getting beaten up. That's the thing is, even if Dern, Dern is when Dern wins, because I'm also going to pick her um, with reasonable confidence. Actually, when she wins, it'll be something praiseworthy. You know, it'll, it, there will be some crazy yeah. grappling sequence. You'll be like, oh my God. And you will have learned nothing because Dern's win is going to come at the cost of, I'm also quite confident, several minutes of her just being embarrassed on the feet by Jan Shonan. Um, like I actually came in today, like kind of prepared to pick Jan just because I rewatched that Rodriguez fight, and I'm like, oh, my God, Dern is not this good. <laughs> She's not as good as Rodriguez on the feet. And look what Jan was able to do to Rodriguez. But you're right. It's like for Charles, he can afford to be aggressive. He's got the out that no one wants to go to the ground with him. And Dern has a much sloppier version of the exact same dynamic that, like, there, there's always another avenue into which to take the fight. So, like, you really almost can't. Uh, unless your opponent is as powerful as Amanda Hebush or more, you really can't get into too much trouble uh, because at any moment you could just grab onto them and make something happen in a grappling context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's just it's just like, am I expecting this to be the most controlled performance of Yan Shanan's career? Because that's really what it has to be. Exactly. It's possible. It is possible, but mm-hmm. it would have to be. It's one of those. Yeah, she'd have to fight pretty much perfectly or get lucky on a couple of – there are just guaranteed to be scary moments for her. And she would have to get very lucky or, yeah, just deal with them flawlessly. It would have to be like the way Holm dealt with Ronda Rousey's grappling attacks where she just knew exactly what to do to put herself back into a winning position. But she is going to yeah. be winning on the feet. I'm very confident of that. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, I mean, there's 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 a, a chance done. Just bum rushes her, gets her out of there instantly. 
I think most of the re- remainder possibilities are those where they have a weird, ugly fight, and then something, something bizarre happens at some point, and Janan just gets tapped out. Do you think Jason Perlo is embarrassed at all about Mackenzie Dern? <laughs> Um, she hasn't really you do your best with what you've got. Sure, she hasn't really gotten better as a striker, has she, at all? She doesn't strike me as someone who would be. I just don't think she's particularly gifted at it. <laughs> yeah, some people just you know it's just not there for them. Yeah. Well, you know, she's aggressive, she's tough, you gotta give her credit for that, and, and she knows what her, she, and, and that is the other thing with the Tisha Torres now fight. Now she knows. Now she knows. The Tisha Torres fight did seem that she had an understanding that there's one way she wins these fights. And it isn't just by trying to prove how scary you are on the feet. Uh, okay. Well, we're picking Mackenzie Dern over five rounds. Some uh, cool things are going to happen. Some very stupid things are going to happen. And it's uh, perfectly likely that uh, Dern loses every moment of the fight that she isn't clearly winning. Um, but that should make for a pretty interesting contest. I don't know if it's uh, if I would have pulled it out of the air as like main event material. But I got to admit, it's a pretty compelling main event for a fight night. Um. And it's not like there's much else on this card which really sings no. main event. No, again, plenty of the fights that are like, yeah, they're, they're, they might be good, but um, nothing nothing screams main event more than this. Okay, let's take a break. When we come back, uh, we're still going to decide. I mean, our options are Francisco Trinaldo, Randy Brown, uh, the boy, Hani Barcelos, is fighting Trevin Jones, um, Mike Davis versus Slavoklov Borschev. Um, we're going to consider our options here and probably just talk about a couple more, um, our two favorite fights from this undercard before, uh, wrapping things up with a, uh, with a, uh, a heartfelt retrospective on, uh, our favorite moments of the career of Jose Aldo after this. Hey everybody, thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards, ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution no amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. As promised, we are now running through the Dern Yawn undercard. Let's um, just go in reverse chronological here. And um, I suppose this is the one that warrants the most detailed breakdown. Is that your feeling, Phil? Yeah. I mean, I think it's the one the most historically relevant fighters in it. Like, sure. One of them is going somewhere and the other one has been places, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Those fighters being Francisco Trinaldo and Randy Brown. It does feel, it is, Randy Brown is a strange thing. He was a, you know, the next John Jones. You know how um, there's this thing Not in the, the UFC. There's, there's this thing in the UFC where any uh, skinny black guy is either the next Anderson Silver or the next John Jones. Well, he was the next John Jones. And uh, that was back when that was getting thrown around all over the place because he made his UFC debut in 2016. Um, and it is weird to think that, yeah, he's been here for, you know, over eight years. But um, he is one of those fighters who immediately... Um, like did not live up to the insanely high expectations, but has been good the entire time and has quietly gotten better the whole time. Um, so he, yeah, he's, he's like honestly the more typical sort of, uh, shape of prospect improvement. And he's been around for a long time. Meanwhile, Francisco Ronaldo has just been around for a long time in general. He's 45 years old. So <laughs> he's actually been around forever. Um, Wait, how old are you, Phil? Phil? Oops, sorry, I was on mute. 
Uh, uh-huh. I was. Uh-huh. You couldn't hear my outrage. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering how younger much. Younger than Francisco Trinaldo, god damn it. Okay, just okay. About. Just... <laughs> Practically younger than Trinaldo. I was just wondering as I was, you know, making jokes about age, um, how offended you might have been. Anyway, Trinaldo's right. older. I tell you, you couldn't hear my spluttering. <laughs> So, yeah, it's an interesting thing. Both guys have been around forever. One still feels like a prospect, but he's not anymore. He's, uh, he, he really, Randy Brown should be entering his prime right now. And Francisco Trinaldo's prime should have ended ages ago. But it's somehow it's, he's still good. That is the weird thing is that he really should have fallen off a cliff by now, by now. He still looks sort of exactly the same. Yeah. He's like one of those Yoel Romero athletes where he's just like Mm -hmm. a ball of muscle. He's just been like some fast twitch monster his entire life. And it just doesn't fall off the way more everyday types of athleticism seem to do. Also, the fact that uh, unlike someone like, say, Tony Ferguson, athleticism is not the end all be all of Trinaldo's style. That he's actually a pretty good technical fighter. And like your Romero, he punctuates his moment of a- moments of athleticism uh, with uh, long periods of not doing anything. Yeah, which clearly is the key to longevity. Yeah, you just pass it out jealously over the years. Mm-hmm. He's had a he had a giant reserve of huge winging punches that he could throw mm-hmm. with startling speed that he was given. Uh, when he came to his, like, he, he grew into being a man, he was given, like, however many million punches he could throw, and he's, <laughs> he could throw, and then he's, he's jealously parceled them out over the next, like, 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah, he had that one fight with Yancey Medeiros, and mm-hmm. he's like, I'm never doing that again. I'm a, I'm a spendthrift from here on out. Yeah, that it was fun kind of... to try once, but never again. <laughs> that was his uh, Romero Costa, I guess. Yeah. Just an insanely fast-paced fight where both guys are killing each other for 15 minutes straight. Um, yeah, so whatever the mystery of Trinaldo's longevity is, um, I mean, the other thing that we haven't, we've yet to mention about this fight is that it is one of the UFC matchmakers' favorite kind of matchups. Which is huh? as comical a size disparity as we can possibly get within the same weight class. Yeah. Usually you get these at heavyweight. Um, where there's like some, some 300 pound, five foot eight guy and you just give him, you know, whatever the latest version of Stefan Struve is. Now, uh, at welterweight, it is pretty shocking that Trinaldo is, let me just check the numbers. Five foot eight. I'm pretty sure Randy Brown is, yes, six foot three. Uh, yeah, I mean, all the people that Trinaldo has fought have been pretty, pretty big, right? Um, yeah, uh, yeah. Well to wait. I think, was his last fight at lightweight actually, um, was it on McDessey? Um, yeah, it was. Yes, yeah. I mean, that was his last, um, he, tra- he was supposed to fight Jai Herbert at lightweight, but it, uh, he missed weight. Yeah. And he's been at Welter. Uh, so, since. I mean, I enjoy the fact that they were just like, oh, so you're not going to be able to fight lightweights anymore. Well, can't fight John McDessie, noted lightweight, who is lightweight size. <laughs> now, fight the biggest, like, the tallest welterweights we can find. Yeah. But honestly, but that being said, he's, he's looked fine. Yeah, he's done pretty well against them. He's a um, miracle. One of the things about this fight is that we, we said beforehand, uh, before we started recording, there's a really strong chance it's going to suck. Yeah. Um, because it's a, uh, I mean, it's a Francisco Trinaldo fight. Uh, and much as we love him, he's not really an action uh, machine. No. Um, he's the coolest fighter on Earth. Uh like thirty percent of the time. Yeah, I mean, uh, he also shares that with Yoel. Yes, absolutely. Uh, he's, it's just that, like, when Yoel really goes for it, well, or at least could, you know, 
do some kind of insane 360 spinning flying knee mm-hmm. into a <laughs> like knee pick slam. Yeah. And uh, when Trinaldo goes for it, it's like it's a big left hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But I think, again, being in a smaller division where just being a freak athlete shouldn't be enough, it does speak to an, – an, uh, that's another reason for his longevity, that he is a, like, fucking meat and potatoes kickboxer uh-huh. um, and is very savvy. I mean, the thing with Francisco Trinaldo is, like, this is pro- almost certainly another reason for longevity. He's got good defense. He's quite hard to hit clean. He's one of these guys that you can hit him clean and you can hurt him. But he's very difficult to hit clean with the same shit over and over. Um, he's he's very adaptable. Moves his head, moves his feet, and counters like a monster when he has to. And with very basic punches, but very well thrown. He hits the body. He sets things up with jabs. He's an excellent fainter. Um, he really has a grasp on like how to manipulate rhythm. All these little subtleties that you want to see in crafty old fighters, Trinaldo has those in addition to a much younger man's athleticism. So there's a reason. He's still around, and, and even at welterweight, has still looked pretty solid. I mean, he went in there and looked great, honestly, against Danny Roberts. Huh? Aside from one hiccup, and that's a pretty standard uh, Trinaldo kind of thing. So can it possibly be boring against Randy Brown, though? I mean, I know I, I agree with you in spirit, but also... Randy Brown is going to have an eight-inch reach advantage, compounded by the fact that he's, you know, like practically eight inches taller as well. He's literally seven inches taller and has eight 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 inch longer wingspan. He is also, and, and increasingly, and this is the story of Randy Brown's improvement into the fighter he is now. A very high output outfighter. He's sort of become a middleweight sized Corey Sandhagen. In these last few years. Eh. Um, so he's just going to touch Trinaldo at every opportunity, right? Like, why wouldn't he? He can literally just poke him and still have a long time to see what's coming back be- before he actually has to get out of the way. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think generally we're going to be looking at a dynamic not unlike Brown's fight with Chaos Williams. Yeah, but I mean, as much as uh, like Ronaldo has kept some of a young man's athleticism, I don't think he covers distance like Chaos Williams does. I mean, his his advantage is that he's simply you know a much better fighter, but he can't just explode through range in the same way that Chaos Williams can. That's true, but he will make oh, you overextend. I mean, he he's. The thing with Trinaldo is, again, it, his, just his mechanics are so much better than someone like Chaos Williams. Mm. This guy actually throws, like, good, tight, accurate punches uh, and keeps his feet under him while he does it. So, I don't know. I think he's also notably a southpaw, which does make me wonder. Mm-hmm. This, this, is, this is what makes me fear uh-huh. how boring this fight can be. Do I trust Randy Brown to keep his jab going against the southpaw? I think yes, because... Um, something that infuriated me about Randy Brown in the Chaos Williams fight is that he can't help but try everything. Hmm. So he, it, it may be the classic MMA overcorrection of he feels like he has to switch stance in order to use his jab, but he will do that. Uh, he switched stance all over the place against Williams, a fight where like he really should have just been outclassing Williams, he just kept trying to, like, be creative and try lots of weird... He likes things that look cool, you know? Yes. He wants to look cool. Uh, Tornado doesn't give a shit about looking cool. He wants to win. Um, But I think he's he is absolutely gonna... Whether he has to switch stance uh, comically to land a jab, he is gonna land jabs. And he's gonna be firing kicks, and he's gonna be putting combinations together. I think ultimately this is a pretty rough fight for Trinaldo just based on output and the size disparity. Like this is a much bigger size disparity than in any of his uh, welterweight fights so far. Yeah, I mean, because uh, historically the way to beat Trinaldo is simply to force him out of the fight on pace. Yes. 
uh, whether that's on the feet or through wrestling. You know, that's that's pretty much been his entire career, whether it's Yancy Medeiros or Michael Chiesa. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, can Williams do that? Uh, I mean, sorry, can Brown do that? Yeah, probably. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure if he's quite... I mean, he is... But he shares enough with Medeiros. He's, yeah, as you said, he's huge. He's incredibly potent, very diverse. Mm-hmm. Um, he's probably not that much. He's probably about as durable as Medeiros. I think one of the things I find myself slightly concerned with, uh, and yeah, you, you mentioned the kicking. Um, I th- think that um, Ronaldo is a little bit like Cowboy in that as he's four people who are more at size parity, he's actually started kicking less. Mm-hmm. He feels kind of, you know, I think he just feels less comfortable just standing on one leg. And, you know, maybe he doesn't have any hips anymore, but I think Brown can absolutely outkick him. One thing I find myself really puzzled by is like whether either of these guys will wrestle. Because mm-hmm. Brown, as you said, will try everything. Yeah. I'm sure, he will try and shoot on, on Trinaldo if he's feeling comfortable. He prob- uh, he but more than that, will. Ronaldo is a, is a good offensive wrestler and Andy Brown is not a good defensive yes. wrestler at all. Very true. Um, I can serious. I can honestly see Trinaldo like racking up an entire round on top of Randy Brown. Yeah, and that was one of the problems Actually, against like, genuinely hurting him. Sure, that was one of the problems against Williams too. Is that um, it was like screamingly obvious that Brown could just maintain his range and sort of touch Williams at will. And he just had to keep getting into the pocket and trying to like do cool defensive moves and, and land counters. And he absolutely will um, put himself into a much, much smaller fighter's range and give him opportunities to, even if it's just like he's going to try some stunt kick and get it caught and get off balance and then Trinaldo's wrapped around his, his hips, like, yeah, that's, um, that's going to be a possibility. I'm going to pick Randy Brown. But um, there are a lot of ways for it to go wrong. And the story, if the story of Chinaldo's career has been um, lots of inactivity, um, you know, with like a- occasional incredible highlights of, of power and technique and, and athleticism, the story of Randy Brown's career has been just overall inconsistency. Like, you just can't count on him. <laughs> um and he has shown uh, more than flashes in the last four or five fights, really. We have seen that, at the very least, Brown is building the kind of output, um, a, a sort of consistency that should be effective against Trinaldo and has been before. But there is still a move-by-move move inconsistency where it's like you're doing lots of stuff, you're huge, so a lot of it's working, but can you please just do the safe stuff that you know is going to work more often? And that's the kind of inconsistency he still has. He's too, he's an innovator uh, uh, to, to yeah, call on your the reasons why he, why he's sort of thought of as a prospect is that he looks like a prospect. Exactly. He is fighting. He's still out there making He'll prospect do some mistakes. Giant, I mean, that's the thing. I'm sure he's going to do some like, some point he's going to do some if he doesn't you know start hurting Trinaldo badly right away which is you know entirely possible as i said he's very potent but you know he's going to throw a giant punch and then like fold over at the hips and then just scoop directly backwards yeah. like flailing his left arm around and like at some point uh, Trinaldo is just going to ding him as hard as he can yeah or take him down I mean, I, I, I did come in here thinking, like, oh, yeah, Randy Brown, he's just going to kind of pick him off. He's really dangerous. Uh, and, yeah, big physical advantages. But I, more more and more, I do find myself thinking, like, Trinaldo just, like, punches him once and then takes him down in another round. <laughs> that could be it. Um, I mean, Trinaldo is not exactly, like, he's not out there knocking everyone out. He heard- no, I mean, I, I, didn't, I don't think he's going to knock it. I don't think Trinaldo will, will knock him out, but he is also someone who stuns people a lot. Yeah, he's a more than respectable puncher. Probably, in fact, the, the, Trinaldo, the classic Trinaldo pace is more responsible for his lack of KOs than anything else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. 
think I'm going to pick Randy Brown as well. But yeah. Um, um, and it's just the fact that, like, it's also Trinaldo's, like, last fights have all been variations on this archetype. Yeah. Just big, tall, rangy striker, and he's won them all quite handily. Uh, mate, I'll, no, I'll, I'll take Trinaldo in a flyer. Yeah. I don't think he should. I don't, he. I mean, Randy Brown really should win this one. Much like the main event, this is a yeah. Absolutely should win this fight. This is there for you. But I'm gonna take. I'm gonna take Trinaldo, Trinaldo just because I'm just getting a bad feeling about it. Yeah, I get that. Although I will say I'm getting a good feeling too, which is the more I think about it, and I'm really setting myself for for crushing disappointment. The less sure I am that it will actually be bad. I, I think I don't think Randy Brown will let it be bad. And I, I mean, think, even that Chaos Williams fight, it, it was a good fight. It wasn't bad. No, yeah. it was a good fight. I, I thought it was a very good fight. It, it's, it's just that you know, the only reason the reason made you it have, a more competitive one than he had to. Exactly. The only reason you had to be upset about anything in that fight is if you're like hoping for something out of Randy Brown, which is always a recipe for disappointment when you decide to invest yourself in uh, one of the the innovator class of fighters. Yep. Uh, too innovative for his own damn good. But yeah, I'm, I'm still going to pick him. I just think... Um, I think it's the smart pick. Mm-hmm. Something can, uh, something can go terribly wrong up to twice, as it did in the K.S. Williams fight, and he's still going to bank a lot of time scoring points and looking very impressive. And he also yeah. might... And there's uh, also like a solid chance that Trinaldo is just absolutely knackered in round three. Exactly. And, and, and therefore a solid chance that Brown makes a big moment of his own happen. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, let's, uh, I mean, that's more than enough time for a full segment. So let's really just touch on these other things. I mean, I think they're all pretty straightforward. Again, these are the half interesting matchups of this card. Uh, Bantamweight, Tony Barcelos, Trevin Jones. Uh, Barcelos is going to win. <laughs> that's good. Do. Yeah. That's that could do. Good. Do should do. Yeah. Um, Trevin Jones is just, he's got, he's a trick fighter, you know, he he will he will trick people in single moments. He, he's 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 a opportunist dyed in the wool, um, and there is absolutely no structure to his game, which which allows him to create those opportunities. He's a one and done counterpuncher who lets his opponents grab and hold on to the initiative the entire time. If Barcelos doesn't win this. I mean, I'm still going to be a little mad at the UFC for, like, wasting this very talented guy whose prime is surely coming to an end. Um, but I will also be just as shocked with Trinald, or with Barcelos. He absolutely should win this. At least Travin Jones beat Timo Valiev. <laughs> so did Barcelos. Shut the hell up, Phil. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I'm not getting into this again. Okay, then we have, um, I mean, I have literally nothing to say about these other things. Like Mike Davis, Vyacheslav Borshchev, it's just gonna, it's gonna rule. It's just gonna be a great fight. It's just gonna be an absolute banger. I haven't put, invested nearly enough thought in it to give you like a detailed prediction of how it's gonna play out. I will say, I have been impressed with the improvements Borshchev has been making, but they've mostly been on the front of, uh, wrestling and grappling. Like he's finally looking like a guy who's, uh, who does, as he does train at team alpha male in that he's still going to like dig his toes in and swing punches and people are going to take him down because of that. But he has shown much better resilience and scrambling ability and a desire um, to like, he's gained the knowledge that he must get back to his feet as quickly as possible and go back to being cool punch man. Um, I don't know what that really means for a matchup with Mike Davis, who is also a cool punch man. So, uh, I mean, I think he's a he's a cool punch man who's just like, honestly, just a bit bigger and more physical. Yeah, that's true. Um, so. yes, a bit a bit less, maybe a bit less diverse. Um, but yeah, I, w- I would probably tend to favor Mike Mike Davis. Uh, Alain Alainek Latifi is in in some ways just sort of sad. Mm-hmm. In other ways, you know, the real, a real, uh, like, how, uh, like, a real test of how, how dad, like, you need to be mm-hmm. in the heavyweight division. 
Lil Latifi 100% should win this. But, you know, he's he's almost 40 years old at this point. Yeah. Um, and yet and... you look at him, he's wearing a, a button-up shirt buttoned down to the fifth button from the collar, you know, with his sleeves rolled up. He's wearing, like, dress uh-huh. shoes with jeans. That ain't a dad. Uh, he's, that's a man who's fighting against dadhood. Exactly. Whereas Olenek is out there wearing, like, a faded graphic tee and... Uh, swim trunks because he didn't he didn't do the laundry, and he's he's at the grill. <laughs> he's like, everything about Olenek. I have no idea if he has children, but he's a dad. There's no denying it. You know, the the problem with him is that he's he's starting to slide into cool granddad. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Um, I don't. He's only, he's only like six years older than. Latifi. Yeah, he's merely 45. And he's only had um, 50 more fights. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, Latifi should just run up to him and knock him out, but he, he's not really doing that anymore, so we could get some really funny grappling exchanges. Oh, my God. But you can't choke out Latifi, can you? And again, that's it's impossible. Be funny to watch him try. It's impossible. <laughs> it cannot be possible. I mean, do we get a grappling stalemate and then we just get some Alinex striking? Because that would also be great. Oh, my God. And and Alinex going to get tired after two minutes? Oh, my God. (laughs) This is... Yeah. This is... I mean, it will be be tremendous fun for until (laughs) Alinex gets tired. But then we could be... We could just end up with Latifi on top for two, like, really majorly uneventful rounds. It's dreadful. (laughs) 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 <laughs> okay, let's stop talking about this card on that note. I mean, there's a couple other highlights here, but we're not adding anything meaningful other than to laugh at <laughs> how almost interesting the matchups are. Let's. Uh, let's... I think Yotko, I'm going to say Yotko Allen, I think, is a fight where I think it's a kind of mean one for Brandon Allen. Because... That's actually an interesting fight. I'll say that. Yeah, I think Yotko is really designed to beat people like Brandon Allen. That he's a very he can be a very flawed fighter, but against someone where their bread and butter is their is their like wrestling, and they think that they're quite a good striker to go with it, mm-hmm. is the kind of person that Yotko is there to beat up on. That's true. Uh, but then again, like Brendan Allen is generally a slight class above. Yeah. Uh, in terms on on the feet, when it comes to those guys, which makes it a little um, a little more interesting. But yeah, it's a I think it's a the kind of mean matchup for Brandon Allen. He's also get, he's still in the process of getting there as a striker. Do not forget that mm. Brandon Allen, who who is yet only twenty six years old, how is that possible? Yeah, guy's had twenty four fights. I mean, he's had a mm. career going back to twenty fifteen. I mean, so he really should be like breaking into his prime any day now. And as a Henry Hooft fighter. I expect where this could be the fight where Brandon Allen turns a corner as a striker. Uh, he has already. I mean, shown... I think, and that's that's I think what makes it interesting because it 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 has to be. Yeah. And he has already shown significant improvement on the feet and over the course of his UFC career. So, um, yeah, it is a good matchup. Honestly, it's it's exceedingly yeah. middleweight, but uh, it is compelling if you're a, a freak like me and Phil. All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we have a fighter far, far better than any of these clowns to memorialize um, Jose Aldo and his uh, incredible career after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support heavy hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are. But no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. And you can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve. So thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. All right, welcome back to Heavy Hands. Um, Jose Aldo, he has officially retired... Um, I don't know. You you never know with MMA retirements. You you thought the guy might have retired after McGregor. You thought he might have retired after Holloway. You thought he might have retired after Yan. 
And there were numerous point, other points in his, um, the last like 10 years of his career where he has floated the idea of retiring, uh, but never actually pulled the trigger. Now apparently he has, uh, with one fight remaining, I think on his UFC contract, he has decided to hang up the gloves. And that's fine, honestly. Um, Jose's post prime career, like a true all time great, has gone way beyond what it realistically should have for any normal fighter, which he's not. Um, so he, a, a well earned retirement. I, for one, hope it sticks. I think he just had a, another child. He's got his burger restaurants, you know. Um, he's an incredible ambassador for MMA and the UFC in Brazil. I know he hasn't always got along with Dana White, but one would hope the UFC would take advantage of the fact that Jose Aldo is beloved by uh, longtime fans around the world and especially by fans in Brazil, and he can get something out of that. Whatever happens, we are here now today to uh, to talk about uh, the career of this man, who is still... And has been since I first watched him fight Uriah Faber, been my favorite fighter of all time. Phil, how are you feeling about uh, the end of uh, of the Jose Aldo era? Um, I had I had a kind of complicated reaction to when Aldo retired. I think I think I am glad that he stopped chasing greatness yeah um because you know i, I think I, I've, I've said this before to you maybe not on the on the podcast but like ma doesn't have a certain tier of great fighter that boxing does mm-hmm. there is a sort of super great fighter in boxing you know your uh your durans and your leonards and your robinsons and so on and so forth mm-hmm. um who had incredible careers, and then a their careers ended, and then just had another incredible career, like yeah. uh, which would have been insanely good, even within the context of the first one. Yep. He and uh, there's no one really like this in MMA. Everyone has a sort of all the all the people that we have qualified for greatness have kind of marks against them and they're all sort of like oh yeah this person defended a belt for a long time or this person you know did well in another weight class but there's it's all kind of horse trading uh where there's there's rarely like a a a definitive super definitive answer that people can agree on uh one person is above the rest you know we talked a lot about aldo's career being, you know, house money, uh, as being like, he's already proven himself, he doesn't need to do any more. Mm-hmm. To get into the Duran tier of great fighters, uh, which, I, as again, again, I will say, I don't think any mixed martial artist has, has actually gotten into, really. Yeah. Um, you have to, you have to go an insane amount further. Like, to get into that tier, I think... Aldo would have basically, he would have had to have beaten P.T. Yarn or Aljamain Sterling. He would have had to claim a belt at Bantamweight. Yeah. And the thing is, I don't think that was impossible. Like, Yarn fight, he just needed, you know, he could have hit Yarn the, the right way. He could have finished P.T. Yarn. Absolutely. Could have, he could beat Aljamain Sterling. I think he could have beaten, um, I think he could have beaten Marab Devalishvili if he'd just been a bit more aggressive. And, and also, there's so, it, there's the fact that the way the sport is organized promotionally, um, things could have been different in a different context. Like, who, who's to say that in a different era, if the UFC wasn't what the UFC was, uh, Jose Aldo had gone off and like uh, challenged like Patricio Pitbull and beaten him? Huh? You know, like eminently possible and you would look at that as like oh my god he won another belt you know like way past his prime that shouldn't be possible yeah it's the fact specifically he had to fight Piotr Jan I mean that's a that's a tough ask for a guy who is clearly past his prime and he still made it unbelievably competitive and won rounds off Piotr Jan and so that's the thing I think at that point and you you I think 
Pablo would have to be asking it himself. You know, that it, even at that point, I don't think the second belt was super out of reach. It was it was almost attainable. And to get into that that tier of greatness, you have to try for things which are incredibly stupid. Yeah. The thing is, to ask that of someone, to want someone to do that, right. you have to want them to destroy themselves. Yeah, we've talked if we had a talk fight, about this before, like the like legacy just being a thing that like greedy fans want. Like huh? we want an, we want a legendary character. And that is how I talk about fighters. That's how I understand them. But it's important to be able to step back and be like, these aren't characters, they're people. And mm-hmm. you shouldn't be asking the dude to spend all that fucking house money and possibly ruin the rest of his life in pursuit of, you know, maybe that, that is valuable to fighters. Fighters seem like the kind of people who care about stuff like that, you know, glory and all that. But you, should, you shouldn't ask that of anyone. Oh. I mean, and, you know, we've seen fighters, you know, who are candidates for greatness, you know, but again, haven't, haven't broken out beyond. Right. Like, like GSP or yeah. Khabib, who, like, you know what, done great things. Yeah. Or, you know, more recently in boxing, you know, you see Andre Ward or Floyd Mayweather. Like, I've done great things. It's enough. It's enough. I don't need to do more. And they shouldn't have to do more. Yeah. There is a level above which you have to do more to get to. But the thing is, to get to that level, you have to be insanely self-destructive. Yeah, like, you have to be willing to spend everything, to leave literally everything in the cage or the ring, and until there is nothing left. Yeah, beyond the already. Glad, yes, even if Aldo had, it would have been incredible to watch him win a belt at bantamweight but like jose aldo i'm a huge fan of him i am yeah. i have like he's been one of the, the fighters i've been the most emotional about watching the sport and i am glad that he is not going to kill himself yeah uh chasing greatness even though even at this even though at i think even at this stage it's not impossible for him yeah don't think he's that but I'm I'm glad that he is and he's still yeah I mean he is I think we agree on this he is he is pretty much he's the greatest fighter in MMA history at this point he is the Duran of MMA as, so as he's much the closest thing we've got exactly as much as no one ever does that kind of stuff in MMA and probably it will happen at some point in the future unless the right thing is done and this sport is banned um probably it will happen in time but uh, at the moment, Jose Aldo has done. I mean, uh, before Aldo's bantamweight run, it was like GSP came back and like took the belt off Michael Bisping, like, and, uh-huh. and, and like, yeah, that was impressive and it was awesome. And kudos to GSP, but that's not a real second career kind of thing. That's not a real post prime run, like. No, it's, like, it's far too calculated. And, yes. Uh, opportunistic. Exactly. That's not Duran or Robinson or Ali. Um, it's yeah. It's just a. It's like a single move. Um. So yeah, I, I'm also glad that Jose retired, and I hope it sticks. Honestly, I, he he owes nothing more, and he's already he has. Yeah, I mean, I G, I was a GSP even as Aldo was my favorite fighter forever. I've always been a GSP as clearly the best fighter of all time guy but that has changed over the last few years simply because of how incredible jose has been after huge setbacks well after what should have been his prime years after showing signs of decline how great he has still been it changed my mind like he's yeah i'm not even going to wait for the dust to settle he's the best to ever do it that's just all there is to it um, so let's talk about uh, our favorite moments in uh, in his career. It's been an incredibly long and storied career. He made his debut as a pro way back in 2004 and uh, suffered one defeat in 2005 and did not lose again until Conor McGregor knocked him out in 2015. Ten years undefeated. I believe he held, if you conflate the... 
uh, WEC and UFC belts. I believe he held that title for n- nine defenses, I think is the number. Yeah, that sounds right to me. Um, just one of those things that just doesn't happen and shouldn't happen in a division that even when he won it, there's a reason like all the hardcore fans geeked out about WEC because even back then, featherweight and bantamweight were incredible, deep, action-filled divisions. So an unbelievable feat to do like an Anderson Silva without the benefit of fighting a bunch of middleweight jokes. <laughs> like <laughs> the, the achievement of just that first title run cannot be overstated. Um, so let's talk about it. What, uh, what moments stand out in your mind when you uh, think back on, the, uh, on this incredible career? Um, let me think. I mean, so I wasn't a huge Aldo fan when I first saw him in all right because this fired. you know this is that fired I said that's it oh, alright bye guys so anyway what's my favorite Jesse Aldo fight <laughs> <laughs> go on go on uh, cause um cause I was a Mike Brown I was a Mike Brown guy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um and you know, I really like the story of of Mike Brown in that he'd been this, um, you know, uh, sort of washed out a bit mm-hmm. until he'd found his second career in the WEC and he'd beaten the Golden Boy Uri Faber, and uh, and then he just got torn to pieces by this hyper athletic freak. Yeah, I was like, mm-hmm. how interesting that Jose Aldo was one of the first seeds planted in your mind of like resenting athletes. No, I mean, I was always like that. Yeah, well, okay. Pretty much. <laughs> but it's got to be one of the early instances of watching MMA where you're like, man, this is bullshit. <laughs> Mike yeah. Brown deserves it. What the fuck? Yeah, but, you know, as as people said uh, at, at the time, uh, not only was Jose Aldo just incredibly athletic, but you could see, I think Luke Luke Thomas was actually one of the first to just be like, this guy is thinking like a computer like yeah. you can see how fast he is thinking and how smart he is as a fighter this isn't just you know this isn't just physically overwhelming someone mm-hmm. this is the next level of the sport um but and you know there was the uh, you know obviously like the double flying knee for cub swanson but these were all, all sort of these moments of um like holy shit, who is this guy kind of stuff. Yeah, that was the Other story than... of the first half of his WEC career was just, I'm mean, honestly, much of his WEC career was just like explosive violence. That was the Jose Aldo story. Yeah. And, you know, the idea was that as a sort of, I guess like a, a, a recent parallel, you might, you might be thinking, sorry, a contemporary parallel, was um, Tiago Alves up at welterweight, right? Mm-hmm. It was also just this, you know, this insane, explosive, low-kicking, flying, kneeing machine. And, like, the differences between the two were not immediately apparent if you were, mm-hmm. you know, a relative newcomer to the sport, like I was. Um, but I think it's the... So I think the first... Often, you know, when you go from, like being ambivalent to a, from a, to a fighter or even like being a little resentful what you need to get them over for you is uh you need them to to beat up someone that you find annoying oh so okay. i think for me it was the uriah faber fight <laughs> and also uh the manny gamburian fight yeah 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 um but yeah i think faber and you said that was that was you know the first the first time you you really saw jose Aldo, right yeah um, yeah, I think that was the very first fight of his that I ever watched. Um, and I didn't, um, I probably got into MMA after that fight. I just think that was the first one I'd seen. Like, maybe I started getting into it around the time he fought Florian, probably. Um, but the first time I saw him was that, uh, a friend showing me that Uriah Faber fight. And, uh, this is, by the way, why, uh, you will never ever be fired. Because uh, you are, as far as I know, the only other pa- person on the planet who also finds Uriah Faber annoying. <laughs> Most people like the guy. Um, but uh, I, what I thought you were going to say, actually, is that um, what you needed to turn that 
uh, that ambivalence into like warmth and respect was to see him suffer and struggle. And for me, I think that's why I think of fights like the Mark Hominick fight as being really great moments in Jose Aldo's career where he doesn't look great and he's got some, some problems going. I mean, he does look great. That's like, that's the birth of boxing Jose Aldo in that fight. That's the birth of the Aldo jab. Um, and the head movement and, and the footwork and all that stuff that we now just assume he's had forever. But, um, that, that, that also did it for me. It was like, yeah, just seeing somebody tested and have moments where they, they don't necessarily look like an all time grade and things are going terribly and they still just refuse to, uh, to be deterred or to be taken out of the fight. Like seeing Jose Aldo's hunger to win, which has also been the incredibly, uh, exciting thing about this post featherweight career of his is after seeing Aldo the champ for so long and just getting little glimmers, seeing Aldo hungry for glory and greatness is uh, is pretty incredible. He he just uh, when he has a desire to make a point, he is a truly uh, unbelievably great fighter. Yeah. Um. I mean, I think so. Yeah, the Mark the Mark Hominick fight was. I mean, the thing was that for a while, I think they were trying to get Aldo across in some way, but yeah. also there were so many of these guys had these wonderful stories that were fighting him, right? And it, it became at least for for me, it was it was it could be difficult to get past that at times. He's just like a dream um, killer. Yeah, like Mark Hominick, like Mark Hominick's rally in the fifth round yeah. in that fight. Um, you know when he's his 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 head is swelling up. Was um, I mean, did was Sean Tompkins alive at that point? Um, I think he was. I think it was actually not long after that at all that there was that uh, Korean zombie fight. Yeah, that was literally yeah. the very next fight. So Sean Tompkins, mm. and, and there was only like oh my god, April to December. That's the gap between. Hominick versus Aldo and Hominick versus Korean Zombie. Yeah. So yeah, I think Tompkins uh, passed away in that interim. And there was, you know, um, uh, Kenny Florian, the great kind of um, great like bridesmaid of lightweight, mm -hmm. who just couldn't win the belt despite being so technical. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it was one of those ones where, uh, and I guess. Part of what like started to draw me towards um, Aldo was a the fact that he was he was winning so um, he was winning in such clean and impressive ways yeah and that the the narrative around that like the, the narrative around him just became so so weird and difficult to understand that people were just like oh yeah this guy's going to outgrit him like he's 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 a wild he's a wild man but you know Kenny Florian's going to get to him with his his technique and you're just like see yeah is, is Kenny Florian going to out technique this guy because he seems pretty good yeah and the comparisons to um and, and the uh, like. The, the comparisons to to other fighters who were like notably not as good, um, you know, like there was a, a long running thing of you know who's the best guy at uh, Novo Uniao? Mm -hmm. Is it uh, Jose Aldo? He uh, you know who's become a boring decision machine since he's won the belt? <laughs> Is it Henan Barao? Yeah, who finishes people all the time, and you know, it, it seems insane to think of that at this point but that was a real thing that people said back in the day is that you know Hanan Barao doesn't give people the chance to have fifth round rallies against him like mm -hmm. Jose Aldo does against um Kenny Florian or Ricardo Lamas um but and you know maybe he's a, you know he's a he's he can finish people with his his wrestling and maybe and you know he's got a more active jab and he hits harder and all this kind of stuff and then you look at the um I remember it was Pat. It was Pat Wyman, I think. On he was he, he said on in uh, who in Bloody Elbow. He he just said, I cannot understand how people are looking at these fighters and saying that like Barrow is better than him. Yeah. Um, if you just look at how like, 
he like Aldo moves like a high level. He moves and pivots like a high level kickboxer. Yeah. He wrestles like a high level wrestler. I mean, that was to be fair. That is has always been one of the best things about Barrow as well. And I remember mm-hmm. that being raised as a point. Um. Uh, in that little, you know, pointless competition between Novu and Now Greats, that people are like, actually, Barrow is statistically higher takedown defense. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I watched Jose Aldo just have a straight up wrestling match for much of his first round in the first fight with Chad Mendez and just easily out wrestle him. So yes. I don't give a shit <laughs> how many takedowns Henan Barrow has stopped from the likes of, uh, of, um, I don't know who to fight Eddie Wineland. <laughs> like, I mean, but also that that differentiation got to the heart of in many of the two fighters in many ways because Barrow was essentially he was planted and jabbed people and low kicked them and when they tried to out wrestle him he simply stopped them dead in their tracks. Yeah. Whereas Aldo was hard to get a shot on in the first place and yeah, but also and just... also impossible to finish on. Yeah, and also just in a, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this many times because it really like opened my eyes to the impressiveness of what Aldo does. Um, that like coach Mike, uh, formerly of Bloody Elbow, Mike Reardon, great wrestling writer, great wrestling coach, one assumes, um, was just astounded by just watching Jose Aldo. Cause yeah, like part of it is just killing the shot before the shot gets in. It's well understood now. Aldo's like, trick of feeding the single leg to his opponents, cutting an angle so they can only get in on one leg, and then just using really basic moves, like just limp-legging and pushing off on their head and slipping out before any takedown even happened. But Chad Mendez wrestled him. You know, he shot in and got collected both legs, and like he took Aldo down several times over their few fights and could not hold him down for an instant. Like, he, he... in, a, in, in addition to just being very hard to get into wrestling exchanges with, was just a better wrestler than the people, the all-time great wrestlers who actually did get to those positions with him, like Chad Mendez um, and many mm. others. So, yeah. I he's... mean, the statistical difference basically came in uh, those uh, Lamas and Dominic fights where he was just like... yeah. I'm totally winning this. I'm just going to spend the last round of this in my guard. Yeah, I'm just going to survive. Which was a, a brutally cynical thing to do. <laughs> for sure. And definitely a reason why I would understand it t- taking so long for people to... Because it is, it is really actually heartening now. Like After the horror of the Conor McGregor era and Jose Aldo's name just being like a punchline for all the fans that started watching when Conor McGregor broke out... Um. That the general consensus among MMA fans now is that Jose Aldo is like the best. It's mm-hmm. nice that he he outlasted Conor McGregor, who looked like he would like end the Jose Aldo era for good. Um, he outlasted him in some ways, and but yeah, you, it's in very significant ways. Yeah, for sure. But yeah, he, it's, he closes his uh, he closes his career out with uh, you know. Three very good wins, yeah, and one a like, completely meh uh, loss, which no one cares about, yeah. And uh, Conor McGregor just simply looks like he's never going to win a fight again, yeah. And that's the thing is that there are, I mean, Henan Barrow, you know, who was his his great comparison. Mm-hmm. He's simply, you know, almost unthinkable to think of that they they were they were just. You know, literally compared head to head for a long time because Hanan Brow hasn't been relevant for years. Yeah, he just outlasted outlasted greats like more than we could have ever thought. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were already talking about that he was one of two or three champions in MMA history who had held off at least part of three waves of contenders. Like con- conceived of that way, that like him and GSP and Anderson, um, how impressive that is, and all of them just faced and Jones, I think, and Jones, and all of them mostly just faced like one or two new breed guys, and then lost, mm. um, or became irrelevant or whatever, and Aldo actually exceeded that, 
he fought another different wave, maybe concurrent with the last wave of challengers he faced at uh, featherweight, but in a different division and still beat them. Not with the belt around his waist still, but it, it doesn't matter at a certain point. Um, and yeah, I can get that. Like the, the, there is a, there is some cynicism to the Jose Alder career. Like you said, the Mark Hominick and Ricardo Lamas fifth rounds, even great fights like the Uriah Faber one, he coasts at a certain point in that fight. Huh? Um, Kenny Florian, he doesn't go out of his way to like, to, 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 to comprehensively beat Florian. At a certain point, Florian's just like bouncing off of him and his brother's screaming at him from the corner and he's trying so hard and it just isn't working. And yeah, Aldo could often be satisfied with just putting an opponent in a position where what they were doing wasn't working. But then you also get, I mean, that was kind of the story of his first round against Chad Mendez. And then you also get incredible exclamation marks like the end of that first and only round in that first fight. Um, because you could tell that he simply wanted to win. Yeah, right. He would do anything to win, and then once he was sure he had won, yeah, he was he was pretty much he was often pretty much done with the fight. Right, so and I like, think oh, that's it. I'm I th- keeping my belt. I think, we'll in see fact, because, you never again because of that feeling that pervaded a long stretch of the Aldo championship reign. Um. That feeds into the fight I want to talk about now, which is the high water mark of Jose Aldo's career, one of the best title fights ever. And particularly because of that, that, that established context of people knowing who Jose Aldo is, what kind of champion he is, what he's willing to accept if it means he has successfully defended his belt. His rematch with Chad Mendez, um, in my mind, the thing that defines that fight is, I think, maybe between rounds two and three, Brian Stan was on commentary still at the time. Boy, I miss Brian Stan. And, uh, and you know, they'd been talking about the game plans of the fighters, and Chad Mendez wants to wear Jose Aldo down. Like, you know, we all know who Jose Aldo is. We know what his weaknesses are. And Brian Stan said, you want to make the champion work? Well, this is how the champion works. And that fight, for that reason, stands as like an incredibly necessary. It could have been a great final chapter. Um, and as it is, it's, it's like somehow in the middle of his UFC career. But yeah, knowing that Aldo can be pushed to this point where um, he's like, okay, I'm winning. Is it worth all this stress and everything? No, I'm just going to hold guard or whatever. I had a hard weight cut, et cetera, et cetera. All these little asterisks that had always marred some of his previous fights. To see Chad Mendez looking himself like an all-time great, like he never had before or since, um, to come in with incredible technique and a great game plan and push Jose Aldo to the limit and see how Aldo responds when he needs to respond to win. I, is like necessary, I think, to understand Jose Aldo fully as a fighter. So, watch Aldo Mendez two again if you haven't. It is an absolutely sensational fight, and right from the jump, Chad Mendez is testing Jose Aldo and making him dig deep. And it's just useful after seeing something like the Lamas fight or the Hominick fight. It's so useful to see how deep the wells actually go. Um, how much willpower and desire to win Jose Aldo really had. Uh, yeah, that, that fight is a true testament to that. It's, yeah, it's the, it's the way he goes after him at the ends of the rounds. It's the yeah. way he tries to get back everything. He tries to get back the knockdowns. Yep. Um, so I think, and it just, it just spoke, I think, Deeply to who these two incredibly talented fighters were, mm-hmm. because for Chad Mendes, he was someone who I think has always was had always been looking for a challenge, and who had been who, who was looking for ways to push himself. Mm-hmm. And Jose Aldo was looking to for ways to win his title. <laughs> to keep his belt. Mm-hmm. 
And I think, you know, afterwards, Chad Mendes was always like, you know, I think he was he was kind of happy with how he'd performed. He should be. That's the thing, is is that... But, but Aldo could not be happy with having a good fight. No. Was not what he wanted. He wanted to get out of there with the belt. And, he, and Chad Mendes could not take it away from him. Yeah. Beyond all the technical... Uh, the technical changes, the... You know, or, you know fact that um you know, Mendes comes out with this library of counters for those jab the way like Aldo eventually works his way around them beyond all of that it's just Aldo outwilling him yeah just having the requisite confidence or desperation or some combination of the two to just like realize when things are going badly and just throw himself into harm's way to get the momentum back on his side. Um, even down to, I mean, I don't know. Do you have an opinion on whether or not Jose heard the horn at the end of round one? <laughs> Cause he drops many. I mean, I don't, not consciously. I'm, I'm Pretty perfectly sure happy. Like, get him. Yeah, I'm perfectly happy to look at that. Mendez is already hurt at that moment. He's, he's staggering backwards. He's fully defensive. And, uh, you know, like in Jermaine Durand me, Holly Holm or whatever, it's always – it's the ref's job to get in the way. The fighters should not be worrying about, oh, I have to stop mid-punch when the round ends. Just go, 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 and the referee should insert himself between the fighters. Um, and he was – I'm sure Aldo has zero memory of that. Uh, sure. Of what happened in that particular moment. Like, I doubt he could hear. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to believe that. But, yeah, even down to – arguably bending the rules and to be fair this is a fight where chad mendes fouls him nine times <laughs> so <laughs> he hits him in the dick on like three different occasions and pokes him in the eye twice um so fair enough you got dropped after the bell once um but yeah like those two really brought the best out of each other because mendes um, I think you're absolutely right. Like it's it's weird to think of Mendes now because, of course, his career got very rocky after that rematch. Um, though he still had some incredible moments, and Volkanovski's win over him still stands the test of time as like a great win against a great fighter. But um, yeah, it's actually it's actually aged much better. Yeah, honestly, it did at the time. But he has literally. And you look back at it and you're like, man, Chad Mendes did super well and hurt him really badly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> For the first 18 minutes, uh, 18, 18 fights of his career, Jose Aldo was the only guy to beat Chad Mendes. And yeah, I think you're right. Like he, he went in there and underestimated Jose and was like, I can literally wrestle anyone. <laughs> so what's he going to do? And just got destroyed and then spent this incredible five fight run just becoming the second best featherweight in the world and found out that it doesn't matter. <laughs> you don't have to just rely on your wrestling. Like again, the, that that Brian Stan quote just defines that fight and so much of Jose Aldo to me. You know, you you want to make Jose Aldo work well. Now you have gotten what you asked for. You have gotten yeah. Jose Aldo to fight you, and that that I think is the Jose Aldo thing. There's there's some cynicism. There's some defensive mindset. Um, you know, there's this reliance on great technique. He's he's buffeted by or buffered by this incredible athleticism, but at the end of the day, he has the greatest fighting mind we've ever seen in MMA. The willpower, mm -hmm. the problem solving, and just yeah, just the willingness to if something goes slightly wrong, the willingness to invite something going much much worse. Um in order to, to turn the fight back around and not to just let the opponent beat him. He never let anyone beat him. And right to the end of his career, um, still, the fights like against Piotr Jan, like the way the first round ends in that fight, why would you go on and keep trying to fight? And yet he does incredible things <laughs> after that. Uh, so, I just love him to death. I love Jose Aldo. And, uh... I think my my yeah obviously the the Mendes fight is his best fight. I think the, you know the one I still have up on my as my pin tweet was his uh um his rematch with uh, Frankie Edgar, mm. um which was just uh, you know very different 
in terms of the uh, the the it was kind of the opposite end of the the Aldo mm-hmm. question that you know you can force him if you can force him into a corner then he'll he'll come back at you. This was just like someone who's been insanely scrappy and driven their entire career. Someone who's just who just came up against him and who was just like turned aside. Mm-hmm. No, you know, someone who, at a championship level, someone who forced like wars out of everyone he fought, and Jose Aldo just fought him a second time. He was just like, no, I don't think I will. Yeah, I don't think I will have a war. I don't think I will have a difficult fifth round. I don't think there's going to you're going to do anything. He just sat there, and just. Made Frankie M. Edgar as, as impotent as anyone ever made him look. Mm-hmm. Other people knocked him out, or you know, um, or hurt him worse. But no one allowed Frankie Edgar to fight the way that he wanted to, and simply uh, like pushed him away. And yeah, <laughs> just said like, like he like he knew everything that was going to happen, and. Uh, Frankie Edgar might as well have just been fighting a ghost. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was another like just, just a, a, a like a beautiful performance from a man who, as I said, he could he, well. I mean, he could just win, and he, he could just win in many ways. But it was always what you could tell what was driving him. And that one he coming just after the Connor wanted to win. That one's yes. coming after the McGregor loss too. It's like, oh, all these questions is, what's it? Is it Jose's first loss? You know, is he, is he yep. kind of have that hunger? Is he? He literally just looks like a better version of the same dude he's been as he's held the title for a decade. Like, <laughs> just, um, outclasses Frankie Edgar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, didn't even let it be as close as their first fight. It also led to some of the all-time great Frankie Edgar fanboy posts. Because oh, yeah. there were a not insignificant number of people who thought Frankie Edgar won that fight somehow. <laughs> and uh, those were a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, let's wrap it up there. Um, I will say now that uh, before the end of the month, I'm going to have um, some commentaries. I usually do them on boxing matches, but there are a number of... Um, easily accessible free Jose Aldo fights up on YouTube now posted by the UFC, which I'm going to use to, uh, to do some commentaries. Aldo Mendez two is of course there. And I think the other one I grabbed is either Aldo Hominick or Aldo Faber. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I am going to uh, have uh, commentaries on a couple of uh, Jose Aldo's greatest moments, greatest 25 minutes. Um, up on uh, on the Patreon before September is done. So if you want more fawning over the greatness that was, that is Jose Aldo, make sure you check out uh, patreon.com slash heavy hands. Otherwise, um, yeah, find uh, Phil on Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson. Find me at Boxing Bush. We'll be back next week to talk about, I think it's Grasso versus... Uh, Araujo, I think, is the fight. Viviani Araujo. So uh, it's an okay-looking card. Could be worse. Um, Big pay-per-view is coming up around the bend. You know, we'll be back. And uh, looking forward to talking to you guys again. And until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face-punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Heavy Hands.